Okay, part two, the turning point. This is where we get back into the details behind what happened in this controversy, this conflict and controversy under Augustine and Pelagius. Now, how key it is to understanding how this myth of original sin entered into the church. In 354, Augustine was born. Like I said, he came on the scene at a time when Christianity in Rome was being established. The church in Rome was gaining its ecclesiastical authority over the, over the regions, over, over the entire ancient world. Well established by this time. The bishops, the popes, the, the influence, the, all of it was there when he came on the scene. He had a perfect power base on which to work and then monumentally disseminate his version of Christian doctrine for, for many years afterwards. He was, like, he was a prolific writer. In 413 to 427, he wrote an immense apologia called The City of God. You can pull out, you can read any of this stuff. It's all highly lauded in history that it's the greatest stuff ever been written. In which he argues uh, for just war, the church militant on earth, and the dual nature of man. Drawing from his Manichaean and Gnostic background, of course. He saw the nature of command as corrupt in the soul pure. Therefore, it was a constant struggle engaged, the good against the bad, the darkness versus the light, as they taught. If you, know, if you look at that Manichaean teaching, it's much like the Star Wars theme. You know, the dark side and the light side, and they're always struggling against each other and trying to gain influence. This is the basis of original sin, that sin was passed down from Adam, corrupting man's nature and making him impossible for him to obey God without some kind of grace coming in and tweaking his nature or compelling him or deciding for him or predestined or electing him. And all that stuff developed out of this out of this one lie, this myth of original sin. That's where it all came from. There's one of his quotes in his confessions in uh, Book 5, Section 10, where he blames the sin on this nature. See, he says, I thought that it was not uh, me who sinned, but some other nature that, within me. So it flattered my pride to think that I occurred no guilt when I did wrong, and I didn't have to confess it. I preferred to excuse myself from blame, this unknown thing which was in me, but not, not really part of me. So it was that nature that I was born with, see. The truth, of course, is that it was my own self, my own impiety, divided against myself. My sin was all the more incurable because I didn't think myself a sinner. Again, that's perfect for a man with his eyes full of adultery and couldn't cease from sin, which apparently it seems like this man was. So he's blaming his sin on that nature, not on the choice that he was making. So he can't, you can't stop sinning. Isn't that, the, isn't that the message today? We've shown that in a number of our videos. You can't stop sinning. Even though in repentance, the clearing is stopping sinning. Very clearly shown in the scriptures. It results in purity of heart. If that don't happen, you didn't repent. But he had a serious obstacle then to overcome with the devout believer from uh, Britannia named Pelagius, as I pointed out before. Pelagius was keenly aware of this influence of Manichaeism and what it had on Christian doctrine, especially in relationship to this nature of sin because of all the stuff he was hearing at the time. He believed as the early apostles, he was right in line with the early apostles, that man was born innocent, he had a free, full freedom of choice, full and independent freedom of choice to do right or wrong. You know, not that he didn't need to be redeemed of, of sin or, or repent, no, but he had a choice. He was alarmed then in his journeys through Rome when he heard that doctrine expounded in, uh, you know, that men couldn't obey God, that God must grant them the ability to obey. So given the permissiveness that he had witnessed among professed Christians in the empire, which he called reformed pagans at the time, just like now, is professed Christians that live, live like heathens, he was deeply concerned that such teachings were given people an excuse to sin, since he was a holiness teacher. Obey God. So like I pointed out before, you know, Augustine couldn't read Greek, so his understanding of all this had to refer to the Latin translations of... of guy named Jerome in the Roman Empire. He was a Roman theologian noted for his vicious attacks against his opponents. Again, these guys, they didn't have the love of God in them. They were just converted to a, a religion that gave them an authority 
at, in ancient times. It was better than living in rags in the streets. So his translations became the basis of the Latin Vulgate, which was used by the Catholic Church as their Bible over the next 1,500 years up until the 20th century, actually. And, of course, it was used even in the translation of the King James Bible into English in 1611. It spans and covers that, that just like I've said in, about the Reformation. So, consequently, much of Augustine's understanding of the Scriptures came from this Latin influence and in the writings that suggested, uh, like Ambrose and, and others, that the Apostle Paul was teaching a transfer of sin from Adam to man, mankind, to his posterity in Romans chapter 5, handed down from parents to children, you know, through the sexual experience. That's why they thought original sin, of basically for many years, original sin was sex. You see how foolish it is. So this was disturbing to Pelagius, and he wrote his own commentary on Romans, showing that Paul was not teaching this, that man's will was free and independent, and there was no sin passed down through the reproductive process. The Bible doesn't teach such a thing. It was a voluntary choice that once choice, chosen, then corrupts you. Just like, a, just like being corrupted, or like if you corrupt a file on your computer, it's, what do you do? You delete that file. There's, you, if it's corrupted, it's corrupted. You've got to put a new file in. Same thing with your mind. Once it gets corrupted, you've got to put a new mind in. That's the mind of Christ. So Pelagius regarded this doctrine as a disastrous concession to that Manichean teaching that Augustine had brought in. It brought about the idea then that infants were born depraved and required baptism to save them. Here we go with that baptismal regeneration. They believe that. They believe Pelagius might even believe that. Although he did not deny that man was born with, with the need of redemption, you know, man still had to be redeemed by the grace of God. But he affirmed that they had the ability to obey God and repent of their sins, which meant stopping the sin. Big difference between what they two were teaching. You see, you see what I'm saying? That's where this whole basis of this is. So that to this day, you'll find, if you look this stuff up about Pelagius, you'll find that he is misrepresented by his critics as denying man's need for grace. You know, saying, in other words, that man can save himself by obey, because he can obey God, and he doesn't need God. Just like when we ask the questions that we've asked in our emails, and they'll say, well, yeah, if we could stop sinning, we wouldn't need Jesus. See, they have no understanding of repentance. What happens in repentance? They don't know, because they've never seen repentance. So to them, well, of course, you know, if we could do that, we wouldn't need Jesus. Because salvation to them is what? You come in your sins. He forgives you in your sins. Takes you in and supposedly cleans you up. Of course, it never happens. But he didn't claim any of this save yourself nonsense, as we don't either. We get accused of the same thing. He just said that man was fully capable of obedience to God and stopping the sin. Just like you can stop adultery if you want forgiven of your wife. Grace, he affirmed, it was stated, like in Titus 2, 11 through 14, the divine aid or assistance from God that came, came about to live a godly life in Christ with self-control in the present age, as it states in that verse. So God, it's Pelagius said that man, God justifies by faith apart from works of the law, but in this the apostle is speaking of circumcision and Jewish ritual, not exempting man from the works of righteousness whereby faith is made perfect. As James points out in James 2, 22-24, man is saved by what he does and not by faith alone. Not by faith. Not like all these guys say that it's faith alone, faith alone. They build their whole doctrine on this original sin nonsense. Well, James blows that out of the water. It's not faith alone. Faith alone is faith of the devils. The faith ain't going to save you. That's taken from his commentary on Romans, by the way. So, to Pelagius, salvation was to believe and to do, as we've shown. The focus was on action. You find many of the things we've taught for many, many weeks and months uh, in our videos is the same thing this man taught. Not God doing it for you. But Augustine, of course, had already affirmed that in his theology and the stuff he'd written and all these things he's arguing for, that you inherited this corrupt nature and you couldn't obey God. So the controversy then began to take shape that would, that would sh set up the outcome of Christian doctrine into modern times. 
So the events moved quickly in 412 A.D. when one of Pelagius' disciples, Celestus, was formally censored at a synod in Cartilage. A synod was just a religious court of the time where they could call you before that and pronounce you a heretic or denounce your teachings. That was some of the corruption that was taking place. It had nothing to do with the Bible. But Pelagius' teachings had still had influence because he published tracts, circulated his teachings in the empire, and continued to create quite a stir because his teachings made a lot of sense to people. Augustine responded by publishing his own tracts, and they even exchanged some courteous letters at this time against each other, but the debate continued to heat up. And when Pelagius then openly criticized Jerome's commentary on Ephesians, that's when the tables really began to turn against him. That's when it got vicious, because these guys, like I said, had no love of God in them. When you come against them, they were like the savage wolf would come out of them. So he experienced then more vicious attacks from Jerome and his disciples, who just started declaring throughout the Roman Empire that Pelagius denied original sin and man's need for grace. Again, a lie, misrepresentation. But it started spreading, started spreading the rumors. So Pelagius, he didn't want a bitter controversy over these things. He was just a lay person in the faith, teaching holiness to the people. He was only concerned about preaching the truth and promoting holy living in Christ. So to quell these disputes, he appeared before two more synods in Jerusalem and in Palestine, in which he was declared orthodox at both those courts, both of them by the bishops. But that wasn't good enough for Augustine. That wasn't good enough. He wanted the teaching of Pelagius silenced once and for all. So he convened his own council or synod, which denounced Pelagius. Oh, yeah, imagine that won the approval of his African bishops, so imagine that, huh? And submitted the whole matter to the Pope himself in Rome. The Pope then pronounced that Pelagius and disciples would be excommunicated unless they renounced these doctrines. Pelagius was not permitted to appear to face his accusers at, either, at that council. It happened behind his back. The charges that were brought against him, he wasn't allowed to answer him, which was totally against even Roman law at the time. He was allowed to face, even Christ was allowed to face his accusers at the kangaroo court they brought him to a Pontius Pilate. Talk about a kangaroo court here. That's the facts. Like they say, just the facts, that's the facts. However, Pope Innocent, who, had, who, who Augustine submitted this to, died shortly afterwards and was succeeded by Pope Zanus. Celestus then decided to put the matter before the new Pope and defend Pelagius' teachings and assuring him that they did believe in infant baptism, which I told you they, they did, and made it very clear that man's will was free and independent, able to obey God. He took a book to the new Pope explaining all this and man's responsibility to repent. And this book much impressed this new Pope. And he liked the high mor morality of the Pelagian followers. He'd, he'd, he'd seen... Uh, their, the practice in their lifestyle. So he spoke to the African bishops himself and he told them that they had reacted to prejudiced accounts of Pelagius and that they should repeat, repudiate themselves of what they did. But they exploded with fire and indignation. He, of course, went to Augustine and they tried to force the Pope's hand against Pelagius. So what did Augustine do? Did Augustine go and, for, you know, please forgive me, brother, I was wrong? No, because he, he wasn't a brother. That's why. The guy was the devil's advocate. He used his political connections to enlist the emperor into the fight. To pressure the pope, and issued an imperial edict. The emperor issued an imperial edict in 418, officially banning Pelagius' teachings in Rome as a threat to peace. Because it upset the empire. You know, teaching against the sin nature, it upsets things today, too. So as the pressure increased from the emperor on this pope, he was compelled then, or he would be expelled from his position, to act, and he issued his own formal condemnation, a heretic. And that's what everybody will tell you today. Oh, he was reputed as a heretic in 418. Every theologian that talks about him, that's the first thing out of their mouth. They won't tell you any of these other facts that I just went over. The kangaroo court, the fact that Pelagius was not allowed to appear, that he was declared orthodox at two other synods, that the Pope was in favor of his teeth. They won't tell you none of that stuff. And it's in all the history books. I confirmed this in three or four different historical sources and cross-referenced it. 
This is absolutely how it happened. So what happened? He and his disciples had to flee, flee Rome and soon disappeared from the scene in a mysterious manner. And their teaching went into demise somewhat, even though there was popped up here and there a little bit uh, along the way. They really don't know when Pelagius died. He probably was murdered, most of these guys were. If you read the edict that was issued against him, it sounds like uh, it was open season on this guy. Read what, what this pope uh, issued in his formal condemnation of Pelagius at the time. You can pull that up, too, on the encyclopedia. And it sounds like, kill this guy on sight. You might as well say that. So Augustine had triumphed. His opposition was silenced. The stage was set for the Catholic Church to dictate orthodoxy up through the Reformation, which it did. The message of repentance and faith was dead at this point. The conflict was decided. It rendered null and void by these Augustinian doctrines of original sin, of election, of predestination, and the nature of God which all developed then over the next few years. All of which originated without any shadow of a doubt from his pagan teachings. All. You can deny it all you want. You can cling to your doctrines of original sin and tell people the drunks and the, and the, and the people addicted to sex and pornography in your churches that they can't help it, but you're teaching a lie. You're absolutely teaching a myth. A myth. Not the gospel. You got to bring those people to repentance or you're going to be guilty of their blood at the judgment. History proves that Augustine converted to Christianity out of necessity. He never abandoned his former pagan ideals. He would resort to any means to defeat his opponents. He advocated just war in a church militant on it, which which led to the to the horrible crusades and inquisitions and the butchery that took place in the middle age of the dark what they call the dark ages. All that came out of this nonsense. Even up to the American Civil War, people that believe this, this horrible stuff, that they doing it for God. See, having a wrong concept and a distorted understanding of salvation and faith renders true redemption impossible. So the old man never gets reformed. He's drug into the kingdom, and the whole doctrine then is wrapped around trying to reform him. And what's he do? He still has got killing and in hatred, in bitterness, in selfishness in his heart. Even though he's slightly around the edges, smoothed a little bit with Christianity. Reformed pagans, as Pelagius called them. That's exactly what they are throughout history. Some a little more than others, but always the same. Not with the mind of Christ. Not with the heart of Jesus. Not with everything made new. The old man crucified. They tell the old man crucified over a period of time, gradually. So the whole thing, it just it thrown out the window. No forsaking or stopping of any sin. Catholic salvation, of course, has been based on this fallacy throughout the ages. And the Protestants, although they broke away from the Catholics in the Reformation, the much lauded Reformation, which really wasn't a Reformation at all, didn't return to apostolic roots. They, they, they got away from the rituals and, and the endless liturgy of the Catholic Church, but they tightly embraced the Augustinian doctrines of original sin, of election, of predestination, and they debated that garbage for the next 400 years. So true repentance and, and true repentance on both sides of the fence is impossible. It's impossible. So further opposition, like I said, rose in the Roman Empire. Uh, dissenters were quickly put down and forced to flee or face, face prison or death. And his doctrines of predestination, irresistible grace, man's inability to obey God, you know, it all gained more and more eminence in the empire as he wrote more stuff. A bishop named uh, Julian withstood him. He had a lot of connections and was pretty prestigious at the time, but it didn't last for very long. So to this day, then, you can go throughout history and you can see that anybody that opposed these things was considered to be a Pelagian heretic, even now. Because he was repudiated, remember, in 418. Well, I gave you the facts. You can look them up yourself or you can just chuck them out the window like you've done everything else. So, who are the real heretics, then? The real heretics... This legacy that's handed down through the ages, it's created this monstrous system of error that we have today. So you, 
many people, they follow the Reformation, they think, well, that brought us out of the Dark Ages and out of all the Catholic tyranny, and it restored the pure gospel message of repentance and faith to the world. But did it really return the church to its apostolic roots? No, it didn't. In a few, maybe few instances that didn't last very long, it might have got close. But it didn't do it. It just created a bunch more. All it did was establish a bunch more factions and divisions in the church and continued to build, like I said before, on the Augustinian error of original sin, the myth. They just debated it for, for on and on, writing books and debating each other over, over the centuries. Had the reformers abandoned this myth, instead of expounding it and expanding the influence of it, perhaps then the work that they'd done would have had a lasting effect into the 20, in the 21st century now. But as history reveals, even they persecuted anybody that denied original sin and taught that man was devoured, depraved, and incapable capable of obedience to God. They persecuted him. Even the, the so-called Protestants. You didn't need the Catholics for everything. If you examine the record, you find Pelagius in perfect agreement with the early church fathers. The concept of original sin did not come about until what I related to you, the 4th century, under Augustine. And it by no means was taught by the apostles or by any of the Jewish rabbis. So who are the real heretics? Who are the real heretics? As somebody asked, I wrote a book one time. The evidence points to the modern churches that still embrace these awful doctrines. We can look at Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Clement, and we can see that every one of these people taught that man is responsible for what he does, that he has a free and independent will, that sin was not handed down. I've got quotes and quotes. I post this on the website. You can look at these things. I've got, I got two pages of them here, of these quotes. Justin Martyr, Clement, Titan, Milano, on and on and on. It would take me 40 minutes to read all these, these quotes. But know that it, they're absolutely 100% in line with this teaching that we've just been going over. Every being is created and so constantly capable of vi virtue and vice, for he can do nothing praiseworthy if he had not the power of turning either way. And unless we suppose that man has the power to choose good and refuse evil, no one can be held accountable for what he does. No reward can be justly bestowed, no punishment justly inflicted upon him who is, who is good or bad by necessity and not by choice. There is a, the soul does not incline to either part out of necessity, for neither vir virtue or vice could be ascribed to it, if that was the case. Nor would it choice be virtue or device reward or uh, result in, uh, in punishment. Again, how could God require that of a man which he has no power to do. See, on and on, right, right in line. Each of us who sins of his own free will chooses punishment, so the blame lies with us, not with God. Clement, to obey is within our own power, provided we have no excuse, we have no excuse of ignorance. Clement again, on and on. Like I said, I, I, could read, I could read these for the next 40 minutes and show you this. Many of these guys were directly associated with the apostles in the second century. You can look up the dates. I got some of the dates posted there in the reference material of when they lived. Until Augustine in the fourth century, nobody argued in favor of an inherited sin nature. Nor did anyone suppose that God existed in such a manner that he predetermined everything from eternity and elected some and elected others to be lost. No, nobody brought any. That's all concepts right out of this pagan philosophy. All of it. They're pagan concepts, easily confirmed by researching Manichaean and Gnostic beliefs. You'll find all that stuff. Both of which teach that sin is the nature and not the choice. Both of them. The, fall the fallacy of this doctrine, it runs directly through the Reformation to modern day, with only a few small exceptions along the way. It's very hard to find any exceptions to this along the way. You trace this opposition, you could draw a line, from every instance and every dissenter was severely persecuted, considered heretics, and thrown out of the system. You can't be in the system and teach against this, as I keep telling you. Perhaps one of the most significant movements to restore apostolic roots to the church happened in 1500s in the Reformation 
in Germany under the Anabaptists. Uh, unfortunately, little is known to them because they're considered heretics by the reformers because of a lot of, a lot of them that went off the deep end with their teaching towards the end. But the movement began in Germany at the dawn of the printing press. And the printing press was assembled in uh, 1439 in Germany. So translations of the scriptures in the native language began to appear to the common man and, and he was able then to read the words of Christ for himself for the first time. So many people started coming to understand that they've been shortchanged by the controlling Catholic Church in Germany for so long. And a little explosion took place. People started getting born again, reading the scriptures. That's how I got born again, reading the scriptures, me and my wife and some, and some friends. That's how, that's how it happened in the church. People started speaking out, writing tracts and materials, exposing the errors that have kept them in bondage to their sin for so long. And they did, they did all this without an organization, without a, you know, any kind of denomination. They published stuff. You know, this is at a time when ink cost a lot of money and paper was scarce. And they gave all this stuff away for free and throughout, throughout Germany at the time. They roamed the countryside, preaching repentance and faith, proclaiming man's ability to obey God and his, his ability to do so. They had no real structure to hinder him, and the basis of it was just following the Word of God and, and the faith that was revealed in the Bible, doing what Jesus said, not debating it, not saying, well, what should we do? How should we do it? Like the Protestants like to do. They like to, you know, we've got to get everything, all our ducks in a row before we can do, do anything. That's why we left the churches to begin with, because they wouldn't do anything. I said, well, let's go out and witness to the people. Let's see what, well, we can't do that. We've got to wait and wait. No, well, you, finally we just said, well, you wait and we'll go. You know, when I read about these guys, that's what they did. You know, of course, that's what we ended, we're ended up, we're, we're heretics. So there's a big comparison here between, you know, what they did is they, they answered the works of John Calvin and all these guys by what they did, not in their writings. That's why it's hard to find a lot of things. A lot of it is just bits and pieces of what they spoke or what they taught you'll find in, in the book. And I got it, uh, Peter Hoover's book, Secret of Their Strength, that you can pull up as an e-book and you can read many of these things yourself about this movement. And like I said, like both movements, the Protestants and the Anabaptists, can be accused of false doctrines. I'm not saying they can't. But this observation that I'm giving you, let's reserve the finger pointing to the original sin issue. Because that is what we're talking about here and what we've been talking about. That has rendered the message of real repentance null and void. And that's the focus of what we're doing. Not all this other stuff about prophecy and the nature of God and this other stuff they got wrong. Both sides got a lot of stuff wrong, but the reformers, they got original sin wrong. And that resulted in the demise of repentance all the way. So, as with every faction then throughout history, if you investigate them, like I've said, the converts, they truly repented, came out of sin, followed Christ, obeyed his word, and they preached his word at all costs. Just like many people are rising up now, the individuals throughout the world, that's what's happening. These are the people that the Bible speaks of, that are not worthy, uh, the world's not worthy of them. The Anabaptists, they were persecuted pretty much out of existence, and they escaped some of them to the New World and throughout the rest of the world at the time. Eventually became other denominations, uh, like the Mennonites and the, and the Amish, and just like the holiness reformers of their time, these splintered organizations quickly became just mere shadows of their original roots, and they all adopted the, and embraced the doctrine of come in your sins. They all preach today. Even the Mennonite churches preach the same thing. Although you'll find much said about holiness and the necessity of obedience, and you see the Mennonite people all dressed up in their little bonnets and their, their, their plain clothes and all that kind of the Amish, you know all about that. But you ain't going to find anybody willing to say anything about the sin stopping, about the clearing, and the zeal, and to vindicate all the things the Scripture talks about. You won't never find no, none of that. To say that a convert, they'll say a convert must want to stop sinning. Uh, they must have a desire to stop. They must even hate their sin. Again, people even say that about child. Well, he must hate the molesting the children. But it's a foregone conclusion that the sin will never stop. Uh, just maybe somewhere down the road, but it never really stops. And like I said, that includes all sins. The grace of God, then, it can call you, compel you, prevent you, even overpower your will in one of, the, one of its many eight different forms that they teach it. The only thing it can't do is stop the sin. That it can't do. 
God can make you believe, make you turn to Him, but at best you're only partially obedient, divided in your heart, and serving two masters. That's the best you can be, positionally declared righteous. All because you were born a sinner, and you can't help it. And that's the foundation of Christian teaching for thousands of years. And it's a myth. You're powerless to obey because you can only choose to do evil from your, from your will. You have a free will, yeah, but it only can choose evil, not good. We went over those things before. The entire lie could be unraveled in one moment's time if you just reject this doctrine of original sin. If grace could stop the sin, any any kind, if, even if under the teaching of Augustine, if he affirmed that grace could stop the sin, his whole teach, his whole house of cards would come down. That's why they fought so viciously against it, because grace, you know, if it can call and redeem and all that, but it falls short of eradicating that sin nature. Although some people on one side of church believe that sanctification takes care of the problem, but of course you never really are out of the out of the woods and you can always fall back into sin. So if indeed, though, that it can stop the sin, then this whole thing comes crashing down. Then you'd have to repent. Then you'd have to stop sinning. Stop your drinking, your smoking, your lying, your cussing, your cheat. You'd have to stop it. Because that's what they'd be teaching. You couldn't come into the kingdom dragging the old man and trying to reform him with all this junk they teach. See, the entire system hangs on the existence of this. The whole thing, on original sin. If it can't be wholly removed, or it don't actually exist, which it don't actually exist, then the whole system falls apart. The amazing thing about this, as we close this lecture, is that millions, if not billions of souls throughout history, since those early times, have based their eternal destiny on this fallacy that you can come to God in your sins. Whole generations have come and gone vanished into time. Wars have been fought over it. Nations destroyed. Everything has happened throughout history as a result of this. It's the top of the pyramid of all the false doctrines. And they'll do anything to protect it, destroy anybody that opposes it. It's Satan's masterpiece. And you can guarantee if you come against this in your church, in your Sunday school class, they will want your head on a platter in no time at all. Because this, on this, stands everything they believe. Everything. Their doctrine, their creed, their confession, everything they've ever done. They would have to give up and say that everything they've done from the time they started the ministry has been wrong. Everybody they supposedly led to Christ, all their family, their friends, their loved ones, their kids, that they led to Christ in their sins, didn't really happen. I mean... That would almost destroy somebody. You talk about a season of godly sorrow and a crisis of conviction. It'd be like Nineveh. That would that would be that would be like some of the repentance we read about in the Bible, sackcloth and ashes for months. That's what it would take. Not this flippant attitude the church has today that we can hang one leg of the and one leg over the other side of the fence and we can keep our foot in the door and go in there and try to influence them little by little and show them the right way. You can't show them the right way unless they reject this first. It ain't going to work. It never worked any time in history. Why can't you see that? It never worked. Why do you think that you can do it? Why do you think you can work with these guys and call them your brothers? I just don't understand it. So we'll close this. And you can take a look at it yourself again. And, and come to an understanding. Whether or not you're going to accept the truth, abandon this stuff, Get on your face and find God for real.